the philosophy of this. A probable diagnosis can be made out with analysis of detailed history. And today, every time I take a postgraduate clinic, I tell them that at the end of the history, before even looking at the patient, you must write down what's your probable diagnosis is. And try to do that, you'll be surprised that often you are right. And if you are wrong, you go back and say, I must have made some mistake in analysis of the history. And I think it's that powerful a tool which we are missing a great deal. And I think today if we really see, when I was trained, we were trained like this, maybe 45 years ago. And I was impressed by the ability of my teachers without much infrastructure, making a diagnosis by just looking at the patient. My teacher would be able to tell the length of an infant without measuring it. Because he had trained his eyes so much that if I was wrong, even by two centimeters, he would pick up without measuring. And I had to measure and be wrong. <laughs> that means one can train yourself so much. Of course, then came the time <clears throat> when we started treating diseases and not even a child. What does it mean? In no disease, we even take a growth or measurement. Because that's not my problem. He has come for pneumonia, you get treatment for pneumonia, don't ask me anything else, I may not palpate your liver. If liver is large, so what? You never told me it is large. <laughs> <coughs> that's, that's the way we go by now. But we have gone even further. Now we don't even treat diseases. We have forgotten to treat a child. Now we treat investigations. <laughs> when you come running to me in a panic, and I said, what happened? Why are you so panic? You said, no, I fell down. So they took an X-ray and they said there is a fracture. I said, no, I won't look at the X-ray because I see you running. <laughs> How can it be? He said, but sir, there is a fracture. I said, you plaster the X-ray. X-ray has a fracture. Not your leg. <laughs> okay, the point is that we, have, we are not even ready to believe our own eyes. But my extremely knowledgeable and a super specialist tells me, sir, I hope I am not born with a congenital absence of pain. That's why the fracture is not causing me pain. <laughs> He's well knowledgeable. No? I did not know there is a congenital absence of pain. Okay. I thought every child cries, probably with pain at birth. And he said, from the heavens inside, why have I come to this hell? You know, the psychiatrists say the baby cries at birth because the baby was inside in a heaven. What is heaven? Air-conditioned room, <laughs> swimming pool, <laughs> no work, and plenty of food. <laughs> Happy life, nine months. When you come out, you say, oh, you have to breathe yourself, and it's so hot in Coimbatore. Where did I come? And you mean I have to feed by myself? Oh, and subsequently, even I have to work. Okay. So, the point is that a good, good history makes your diagnosis. What do you then think? I think it's, it's a nice idea. Maybe we have gone past that, but we must still try that. My postgraduate is told to write physical finding that he expects with a good history. Oh, do I expect a pneumonia? Do I expect which side pneumonia? Oh, you can get to that extent. And therefore, physical examination can be anticipated. <clears throat> then you examine and you conquer, then you know you have mastered the history. Doesn't matter if you are wrong, you can correct. But that's the way we learn. After all, we must learn by mistakes. But the problem is we have not learned that there is a mistake at all. No? <laughs> so how do we learn that? And I think that's where. And then you can have a laboratory test. Today when I take a round in my <clears throat> general hospital, my resident says, Sir, everything has been done. We have no diagnosis. I said, what is this everything? <laughs> okay. Everything includes anything. Okay. And he says, Sir, there has been a fever for a month. We have done CT, MR, blood cultures, anaerobic, aerobic, fungal, okay. And we have tried uh, gentamicin, cefotoxime, and sir, now piptas and vancomycin. So I want to know whether anti-TB is worth it. <laughs> this is the statement. I said, what's your diagnosis? He said, that's why I called you, no? We have <laughs> now, and what did you do all this time without a diagnosis? <clears throat> that's why, what do we do? <clears throat> a misapproach. We call this a misapproach, which is management first. If it does not work, then investigation. <laughs> if investigators also don't tell anything, you have lost two, three weeks by then. Then you say, what are your symptoms and signs? Why am I not getting you all right? <clears throat> 
That is our way, isn't it? That is a misapproach. You must have a heat approach. First a good history, then only investigation, if required, and then treatment. But generally, it's a management first. And I think if this is the way you follow, then exactly you will know where it is. We have done this before. We must have an anatomical diagnosis. When you take a history, the first question you ask yourself is, where is the disease? And now you know, it's not a liver disease. A liver has four components, a hepatocyte, biliary tract, a venous system, and a reticular endothelial system. It's not a kidney disease. It's a glomerular or a tubular or a collecting system. It's not even glomerular. It's an endothelial or epithelial. It's not tubular, proximal or distal. All that you can make out in simply by history. And if we know that, then only we can proceed further. So microanatomy of each organ is important. <clears throat> then pathology. We must know whether it's an inflammatory disease, infiltrative disease, degenerative disease, all by history. We know inflammation is fever, it's generally acute, but a chronic inflammation may not have fever. Infiltration is an organ enlarging, and a degeneration is a functional deterioration. We do use this term. I mean, just now, Bala showed a child of a deterioration. We knew, and our chairman said Wilson's on the first slide only, because he picked up a degeneration, and he picked up a neurodegeneration, and he said, no, it must be a Wilson's. So, it is that easy if you put up. Etiology is a guesswork, and several etiology. And important is a function. A, a child with a mitral stenosis could be an athlete, or on the other hand, on the deathbed. Mm -hmm. What do I understand by you are telling me is a mitral stenosis? You need to tell me how his cardiac function is, which tells me how aggressive or otherwise I should be. And I think this should be. And to facilitate this, <coughs> we must have, use adjectives. The child of Wilson disease that Bala showed had a slowly progressive chronic deteriorating disease. Put all adjectives, then probably it was not a viral infection. May have been a chronic viral infection, like an SSP or an HIV, but not a usual viral acute encephalitis. Adjectives tell you a lot. And I think if we keep this in mind, then probably you exactly know that. And this we just did. Don't say he has a GI infection. Or G is from way down. Okay. And try to differentiate a lower intestine from a, a small intestine from a large intestine. A small intestine diarrhea is a watery diarrhea. A large intestine diarrhea is a mucoid diarrhea. Okay. There are differences of this kind. And I think each time, therefore, if we come down to a microanatomy, it becomes very, very easy to first define where the disease is. If suddenly in this room now, you hear a sound and a noise, <coughs> first thing I want to know, is it coming from inside or outside? Unless we know that, how, how can we proceed? If it's from outside, then I need to understand suddenly or gradually increasing. If it's a gradually increasing, that means the sound is coming from far off, coming nearer to me. So there must be some procession or something. Okay. Then I must see the surrounding issues. I hear a noise, a big thud noise, and then a people crying loudly. Oh, there is an accident. And then I see people suddenly happily shouting. Oh, there must be a Bollywood actor or a cricketer. Everywhere there is a noise. But that noise anatomy and then the pathology and the type of noise so makes me understand what I should do. And I think if we do all that, then probably we will, and we'll apply this now to different kinds of systems. And you will wonder how you can diagnose things which a super specialist may not. Of course, super specialist has to confirm. And what is the definition of a normality in a super specialty trained person? Total absence of abnormality. <laughs> then only he calls you normal. So if I say, how are you, sir? No, I'm normal, sir. Don't take it normal. Huh? There are occult diseases and silent diseases. <laughs> you better investigate. This my super specialist friend will warn me. Okay, because for him, a proof is important. And I think this was an eight-year-old. Recurrent episodes of short-lasting, self-limiting immaturity. We'll apply it systematically. What is immaturity? Okay. 
is largely glomerular or it may be coming out from a collecting system. If it is coming out from a collecting system, often there could be pain. If it is glomerular, often there will be no pain. Ask these questions. Okay, is it a cola colored or a fresh urine? Cola colored is coming as a glomerular one. Otherwise, a fresh one is coming from a collecting thing. Then it is recurrent. Would a collecting system problem be recurrent? Maybe, but with pain and short lasting, self limiting. What did we say just earlier? Something that happens suddenly, disappears suddenly, recurs, is allergy. So this looks like an allergic kind of a thing. Happening suddenly, disappearing suddenly and recurring. So cause already in my mind is allergy. What happens suddenly is trauma, allergy, vascular, neurogenic. Okay. Of which what disappears suddenly is not trauma. A vascular may, neurogenic may. And I think if we apply this, then I know that is it glomerular nephritis or urolithiasis as a common thing. Oh, no pain. So this is a recurrent glomerular nephritis. Okay. <coughs> if this is so, then what does it mean? Either it is non-progressive or a slowly progressive disorder. Is it an Asian? No. Asian does not just get better like that. Is it a chronic interstitial nephritis? Probably no. Okay. Therefore, this is a short-lasting, self-limiting, allergic glomerular nephritis. One could almost diagnose an IgA nephropathy with this. Not diagnose, but suspect. And I'm sure that even complicated disease like this could be picked up by analysis. What did we say? It was a non-progressive or a slowly progressive allergic disorder. And I think even if you come to know that, you know where it is. What was this? A 12 year old repeated episodes of watery loose stool over the last two years. Watery loose stool, so intestinal. Recurrent. Admitted recurrently treated with antibiotic, continues to suffer marked loss of appetite and weight. How do you put this now? Small intestinal disease, chronic, recurrent, marked loss of appetite and weight, so worsening. So chronic, progressive, all right? And then look at the marked loss of weight. What does that mean? There is an increased metabolic rate. So either inflammation or infection. Infection at that age is rare. So inflammation. So now anatomy is small intestine. Pathology is inflammation, non-infective. Why should a 12 year old get infection unless he is immunodeficient or an HIV? Therefore inflammation. That loss of weight suggests that an increased metabolic rate and therefore an inflammation, non-infective and therefore progressive. Now look at that, progressive, non-infective, inflammation of small intestine. That is Crohn's disease. Maybe ulcerative colitis, maybe whatever. Point is that, just pick up every thread and put my anatomy, pathology and a guesswork of etiology. Etiology is a guesswork <coughs> based on this chronic progressive inflammation. So it's an inflammatory bowel disease. This child should be picked up as an inflammatory bowel right to begin with in the first three months. Whereas he goes on for two years doing a malabsorption study. How is a malabsorption child? Oh, he's eating well and not growing. Whereas the dish has a chronic progressive loss of weight and appetite. Look at the celiac, he will come slowly as an abdominal distension, not doing too well, but he's not deteriorating fast. And I think small difference of this kind can make you get a pathology clearly. So if you could diagnose, suspect clinically, IgA nephropathy <coughs> and a Crohn's disease, oh, what those simple common diseases, they must be so easy. Even the complicated ones can come up this way. What about this? <coughs> There's a six-year-old with abdominal pain for four months. This is so common. Can we put the same hypothesis of anatomy there? Okay. This is a periumbilical dull aching, at times fairly significant, does not disturb play, sleep, appetite, etc. What's the anatomy? It's a dull ache, a generalized pain. If it was a spasmodic pain, it would have been an intestinal or a ureteric or a biliary tract issue. It was a dull ache. What is a dull ache? Probably maybe a, a stomach or maybe a peritoneum or maybe a lymph node, some mass. That is the kind of an anatomy I start thinking, even on such a recurrent thing. If it was an epigastric pain, yes, it was a probably a, a acid peptic disease. This is a dull ache periumbilical pain. Therefore, this is a generalized pathology. 
what is generalized pathology? Either a lymph node pathology or maybe a peritoneal pathology. What is peritoneal pathology? Either a peritonitis, either a plastic peritonitis or maybe a ascites and this child doesn't have an abdominal distension and therefore ascites is out. This child has not been worsening over time, therefore probably an infection is out. Therefore he must be having a lymph node disease if at all. And it may be a lymph node disease of Hodgkin, tubercle, whatever. Therefore pathology is an SOL, persistent non-progressive and therefore you ask for an ultrasound. Now today when you ask for an ultrasound you must tell the parents ahead of time what report will not bother you. And if you have not told them that there would be glands and there would be free fluid but don't worry about it, often they are normal, then you are already primed them not to worry about it. Otherwise they will come and say there are lymph nodes, that means TB or malignancy. And I think this child therefore also went through the similar thing. Now there is no way, this is today a very common situation, but if a child has been having problem for four months and not deteriorating, it is likely to be a non-progressive disorder or could be a very slowly progressive disorder. Hodgkin's can progress very slowly. You don't announce this as functional disorder, but there is no <coughs> hurry at all. Can I not do an endoscopic biopsy? Yes, I can, but nearly sure I will get out with a non-specific inflammation and no answer to what I am searching for. Therefore, I tell the parent that very likely this is not important, but let's wait for the next one month Let's see carefully whether there is new symptom coming up, whether there is a loss of weight, there is anything else happening. We could repeat an ultrasound again and then take a decision. Many of these, and this is very common, we call it a functional or whatever, but I think the same philosophy of anatomy pathology works even here in a functional disorder and we will have to wait to see whether this really is so. What about this? <coughs> this 12-year-old child came with moderate high fever, headache, vomiting for 5 days, followed by drowsiness and a convulsion. Now what's the anatomy like? There is a headache and vomiting, so looks like a meningeal one, and then he becomes drowsy, so encephalon. So you have an anatomy, meninges and encephalon. Okay. What's the pathology? Obviously inflammation, because you have an acute onset fever. Now what's the etiology? <coughs> acute infection? Probably bacteria, because you got that, all right? Now see the fun. CSF has 100 cells, 70% neutrophils, 78 milligram protein, 43 sugar, and a CG scan normal. Now if this is so, now I get to my basics and said that if this is an acute bacterial meningitis, I'm picking up on day five, then how do I differentiate a TBM from a bacterial meningitis on a very broad clinical ground? The rule that I follow is that in a bacterial meningitis, a clinical and a CSF picture go hand in hand. If the child has a day five of an untreated bacterial meningitis, which now is getting drowsy and even convulsing, <coughs> that means he has got a much advanced disease because he was not treated. I think he would have a CSF showing 1000 milligram proteins and a 1000 cells and maybe a 0 or a 5 milligram sugar. This cell did not show that. So disparity between a CSF examination and a clinical story tells me that this is not an acute bacterial infection. And I think this is the way one can pick up a tubercle straight off and this child on a repeat CT showed exactly all that. We could have picked it up even earlier. This is the way you pick up even on when you are confused, you look at something that is happening over time and something that you know is the disparity. For example, I recall a child who came back from school, a healthy looking, perfectly fit child, and he came back from school with fever. And in the next four or six hours, he was seen to be getting tachypnic, and next morning he came with a severe tachypnea and had a massive pleural effusion. <coughs> Now when he had a massive pleural effusion, they did an acute onset high fever and a pleural effusion. They did a count which had neutrophilic leukocytosis. They tapped the fluid, again neutrophilic leukocytosis. They put in a drain there, it's an empyma to them, and gave a two antibiotic. He would not get well. How can he get well? Empyma does not present in 12 hours. 
what present suddenly is trauma, allergy, vascular, same thing. Infection don't present within 12 hours. Therefore, that was a tubercle pleural effusion of an acute allergic inflammation. So many times, the origin, duration, progress, or in this child, the kind of a discrepancy between a CSF and the clinical story would certainly tell you where you are. This was an eight-year-old child who had a generalized weakness for two months. Now, again, I'm trying to show how a weak symptoms like this also has an anatomical distribution and an anatomical counterpart. Now, when he has got a weakness for two months, confirm how chronic he is. Well, going back then, he's avoiding to play for last three months and he's apparently normal. What's the anatomy? <coughs> when you see a generalized weakness, you want to know what is this weakness. What is weakness? Weakness means I don't want to be active. What makes you active? Your muscle power. So, a child who comes with a generalized weakness has almost an anatomy at the muscle level. It could be diabetes, okay, because the muscle is not getting a proper use of glucose there, therefore is weak. And a child with diabetes will come with a weakness, polyuria, polydipsia, etc. And therefore, it's a muscle disease. That means, even with a vague abdominal pain, we could say peritoneum or a lymph node. With a vague general weakness, we could say, oh, it must be a muscle weakness. How does a child of a cardiac disease come? Probably an exertional dyspnea. What is that? A muscle. Why muscle? Because he's not getting enough perfusion. So the cause of a muscle weakness could be metabolic, could be vascular, heart disease, may not be getting oxygen, or maybe have not having potassium, so hypokalemic. That's the next thing to look for. And this was a chronic one. And therefore we said that this is a non-inflammatory myopathy. The point I'm making is that general weakness can be called as a non-inflammatory myopathy. Makes sense to a clinician because when you use the word myopathy, you said, what is the cause of a muscle disease? And you said, look, it could be a decreased supply of glucose or oxygen, so hypoxia, ischemia, reduced hemoglobin. For example, a child with a slowly progressive anemia may come like that. A child with a slowly cardiac dysfunction may come like that. A child with an interstitial lung disease, this was that, came like that. The point is that even a vague symptom like a general weakness has an anatomical localization in the clinician's mind. If he did not have that, then he would not proceed to correctly diagnose what the probable cause of this situation. Having said this, let me give you a few examples of how the even importance of a chief complaint is. These three children, six-year-olds, presented with a similar history of fever, vomiting, and abdominal pain for two days. When there are multiple symptoms, you ask the parent, what is the chief complaint? If a chief complaint is fever, this is an intra-abdominal infection, be it a dysentery, pyelonephritis. If vomiting is a chief complaint, hepatitis. And if abdominal chief complaint, appendicitis. You just diagnose these three common conditions by asking the mother, what's the chief complaint? Abdominal appendicitis, the chief complaint is abdominal pain. He's crying with pain. Hepatitis fellow is not crying with pain. He's bothered about his vomiting. And a pyelonephritis or a dysentery fellow is bothered about his fever. He also has other two symptoms. A chief complaint makes a lot of sense. And therefore, you could exactly do a specific investigation. This is where three chief, three complaints came together. And you have a chief complaint, which was one. What happens if this is a child, two six month old infant present with similar history? Fever, vomiting, loose stool for three days. Okay. Now, in this situation, sequence of onset of symptoms were important. In first child, fever and vomiting came first, diarrhea followed. This is a typical GI infection, by then vomiting start. But in the second child, the fever and diarrhea started, and vomiting came up by the time diarrhea stopped. Now, this is to be differentiated from a GI infection, and this is obviously parenteral diarrhea. This could be a mastoiditis, meningitis, pneumonia, whatever. Yes. All, all two of them have same symptom, but if you ask which is the sequence of event, a child who starts with fever, vomiting, diarrhea comes, vomiting stops. But here it has been the other way around. You cannot call it a GI infection. Though superficially, if you did not take a notice of sequence of event, you would end up calling it as 
just a GI infection and you would miss something that is totally missed and then a child may convulse with meningitis or may get a tachypneic because of pneumonia. So it could be that easy if you just spend a little time in thinking. This was a 10 year old child who came with a gradually increasing abdominal distension, edema of both the legs for a week. This is one example what we want to give when there are symptoms over a long time. If this child had abdominal distension for two weeks, then edema for a week and a tightness of a limb for two days. When you saw him at the end of two weeks, you have multiple choices how to analyze. You could say, let me see what I would have done in the first week when there was no edema at all and the only symptom was abdominal distension. Abdominal distension would be either ascites or the organomegaly. Okay, if this has come up acutely, as the history suggests, then he should have been sick. But he is not reporting sickness. So I get back to the mother and say, no, no, tell me how he was before. Then she says, yeah, he has been having a little more protuberant abdomen. So I suspect that this must be chronic because if it was an acute onset abdominal distension, what is acute abdominal distension? Oh, it's like a subacute intestinal obstruction, acute inter abdominal infection. They are all sick children. This did not present as sickness, so it has to be chronic. You have to get back and say, how was he last three months? Ah, now that you ask me, he's not doing well. A history of chronicity is suspected straight up. Therefore, it's chronic. If it's chronic, then ascites and abdominal distension, small differences. Ascites develops within next two, three weeks and then stays there. Does not go on enlarging. But a hepatosplural megaly or a mask can go on enlarging. And the reason is that once fluid accumulates, there is, an Im there is a balance struck between a secretion and absorption and therefore in the first two weeks the ascites goes on increasing unless there is an ascites of a liver disease then it can go on increasing because of primary liver disease and therefore this obviously went to me that oh this must be hepatospinomegaly why did the mother complain about two weeks something must have worsened in two weeks so I diagnose hepatospinomegaly with ascites straight off on this history if you diagnose hepatomegaly with ascites, you have diagnosed cirrhosis only. Just on the history. Now you take the edema. Okay. And what is edema? Edema is cardiac, renal, hepatic, nutritional or allergic. Simple. If it's cardiac, breathlessness. If it is renal, maybe oligure, emeshore, whatever. Like an nephrotic generalized anasarca. If it is angioneurotic edema, maybe itching, etc. If it's nutritional, not at that age. That means it is not a primary nutrition, so it must be hepatic. Again on edema, hepatic. By first week, hepatosclerosis with ascites. Second week, even if I don't consider hepatosclerosis, it's still hepatic. That means I'm right. It's a hepatic disease, and then he gets tightening of the right upper limb. What is tightening for a clinician? Increased tone. What do I ask? Recurrent or persistent? Recurrent is tetanus, tetany. Persistent is a pyramidal tract or an extra pyramidal tract, simple. If it's pyramidal tract, there would be paresis, therefore extra pyramidal. So now, this child has got a hepatosplenomegaly, ascites, edema, and now extra pyramidal basal. So Wilson's is clear, just by the history. Okay, how powerful can the history be? And that's why when Bala showed that slide, my gentleman here said Wilson straight off on the first line. Okay. That means the history can make you so powerful. And I think this is one example of how this is. What about when there is no clue at all? This is a six year old child who present with nephritis for last three days. Okay. But he passed history, pneumonia and ITP. Now who is this fellow who is so, nature has been so unkind to him. Which means pneumonia, ITP and nephritis have the same etiology. So this straight away an immune mediated disorder. Importance of past history. Okay. Otherwise I'll say, oh you have an Asian maybe, don't worry, you'll be all right. No, no, he's not going to be all right. He will come with something more. And I think a past history. What about this child? Eight month old presented with persistent vomiting. These are all live real cases. Okay. Now persistent vomiting. What is vomiting? A GI. And I could not get anything further. And going on for two months, multiple tests. When I don't understand, I ask past history, family history, birth history, everything. 
When I asked for a personal history, I got anorexia, constipation, irritability, polyuria. Mother complained only of vomiting. I got all of them. My registrar quickly came out with a hypercalcemia as a diagnosis. Only because personal history was asked. Otherwise, a lot of tests were done. <clears throat> this is how, when you don't understand, you get to the past as well. And therefore, this is the way probably you would go by. I have almost finished. What, what I wanted to say was that the whole philosophy of this kind of a talk is what powerful tool we have if you just listen to the mother and try to get the maximum. How does a CBI work in this country? The moment you report something, theft or some murder, they don't start searching everywhere. Oh, they first sit down. Imagine Raja and all those are still being interrogated. Detailed history. <laughs> only they can be caught. Okay. And the other day, the, the Anil Ambani's Reliance executives are inside. Detailed history. They are put inside. The judge says no detailed history. Then we will get them out and see whether they are capable. But will they get treatment? Yeah. <laughs> yeah they are recurrent also. Yeah. And I think the, all that I want to say is that let us use the powerful tools that we have. And we will know so much. We have tried to do medicine, complex medicine, looking simple. We are all aware it's not that simple. But more you practice, it looks like simple. And I think, what's the advantage of it looking like simple? You get confidence. And you say, I know what it is. And I think if you practice it, you will really be rewarded. Thank you very much.